stream. We are dreamed into existence. What we do with that dream is up to us. This is Stream. I am Jessica Deruta, and I share with you my stream of consciousness and host Sacred Conversations. Listen for free on your favorite podcast app and follow me on social media at Trust Psyche. The best way to show your support is by subscribing to my YouTube channel, Trust Psyche. Click the notifications bell to be updated about new monthly videos. One of the things I love most is teaching people all around the world to do what I do through online courses for all levels. Find me at TrustPsyche.com where you can begin studying astrology with me right now. Trust Psyche production and music by the lovely Travis Deruta. Let us begin. How we dream is as important as what we dream. For the what of the dream knows itself through the how. I am super excited to be here today with Christina Hardy from transpersonalservices.com. And this is stream 22 on August 9th, 2020. Christina is both a professional evolutionary and archetypal astrologer who gives readings, teaches evolutionary astrology, and also does past life regression work. Christina and I share a rich history together from uh, the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness program out at CIS, the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, California. And recently, Christina moved to near outside Asheville, North Carolina with her husband, Chris Bache, who is a teacher of mine, and many of you are familiar, but yet this is actually how Christina and I officially met each other. Um, My husband, Travis, and I had taken a workshop with Chris, I think back in 2015, and we shortly after were driving across the country from San Francisco to Massachusetts to pick up Travis's very large base. And uh, Christina and Chris invited us to come stay with them. And so uh, the second we walked in the door, I remember uh, we sat down and Christina started talking about astrology and and past life regression work. And we've been in a conversation ever since. And so I'm super excited for all of you to get to join in on that today. And um, the last thing I'll say is that I also had the great honor of Christina and Chris being a part of our wedding ceremony almost three years ago here Mm -hmm. uh, on Siesta Key Beach. And so we just have a lot of nice karmic threads together. And I'm just so touched and honored and excited that you, Christina, Mm -hmm. can be on the stream today. And I would just love for you to take some time and share anything you want to share about yourself with everybody listening all around the world and um, Mm -hmm. to also then introduce our topic for today, which you um, have proposed. Mm -hmm. Well, I thank you so much, Jessica. It's, um, it's really an honor to be here in dialogue with you. It's in, it's an honor and it's just so exciting. Um, I love your astrology. I love what you have to bring to astrology. And it's just, I always get inspired when I hear your podcasts and, and, and your class material. And um, so it's, it's just a real honor to be able to be on your podcast, on your streaming podcast. So thank you for inviting me. And what a delight to be able to connect with you. <laughs> oh, yeah. So it. I'm going to actually start with a little bit brief of my history with astrology, which actually then dovetails very nicely with how I met Jessica. So I'll insert that in there in my little bio here. Um, so I actually, so just to start off, I, I began my astrology quest or I was introduced to astrology way back when I was about 27 years old and I had, I was studying geology at the time and I was working on my bachelor's degree at, um, uh, Santa Cruz, California. And I was in my senior year and I was bumping up against, (laughs) Um, In my senior year of geology, just all the, I mean, I've been taking science courses all along, but 
they ended up getting really heavy duty that that last year of, of my bachelor's degree. I was taking geophysics, geochemistry, and classes that it was just like, uh, I just felt like I was bumping my head or knocking my head up against the wall trying to understand um, what I was studying. And I never felt like I really was getting it. As, and as much as I really was passionate about geology and studying the earth and the earth's dynamics, uh, and that still is in my heart today, I just knew also that I would need to leave the field because if I was having that much of trouble in my uh, senior year at the undergraduate level, I also knew that I would need to go to graduate school if I wanted to do what I wanted to do. Uh, and it would be all that much more sort of mathematically based science. Uh, so uh, I was I was lost. It was it literally felt like uh, the rug had been pulled out from underneath me. I had no clue what I was going to do next. And because I had been so focused on geology and um and I'll, yeah, so um, so I lo and behold, I decided to look up an astrologer, and I have no idea why I chose to to connect with an astrologer for guidance for the rest of my life. I, I can't remember what kept compelled me to do it, um, other than the only thing I can think of is that I was in Santa Cruz in the early '80s, and there were a lot of astrologers around. But that's what I did. I chose an astrologer, and. Um, so I had, by the time I walked out of my session with the astrologer, I was just totally blown away. She didn't let me speak the whole time, even though I kept trying to um, insert like, or just affirm what she was saying, but there, she wasn't having any of that. By the end of the hour, I felt like she, like I, she had just described my personality as far as what I knew of my personality at that point, and remember, I, this is sort of, I was, this was actually around my Saturn return. I was entering my Saturn return at that time. Of course, she didn't mention Saturn return or anything like that, but there was a lot I did not know about myself. And it, but everything she was saying really resonated, even though I didn't quite understand the rest of what she was saying. But so from that point on, I kind of, I followed my astrology. I would go to astrologers maybe once a year or so, uh, and over time, um, eventually I decided I, I did work in the field for a while. I, uh, I was in, on the West Coast then, moved to the East Coast, but I always knew I was going back to the West Coast. And I decided um, due to being pretty lousy in relationships that I really needed to study psychology uh, to understand human relationships. And then that led me to transpersonal psychology because I knew I needed a spiritually oriented psychology and that brought me back to California in, in 1992. And I graduated in 1995 with my master's degree in transpersonal psychology. And around, after I had graduated, I still wasn't quite sure what I was going to be doing, but I wasn't, at that point, I really was not concerned about it. I was having a blast. Um, out in, I was out in the Bay Area. But then someone handed me an audio tape of Richard Tarnas speaking um, about uh, a book that he come rec fairly recently come out with, maybe three or four years prior to that time, uh, called The Passion of the Western Mind. And as soon as I heard uh, the recording, and about halfway through it, I just knew I needed to learn more about this person. And, and then at the end of the audio, he talked about a graduate school program that he was uh, a director of and and faculty member in, and I'm like, oh, wow, I've got to check this out. And it was just a complete overwhelming, in a positive way, compulsion. So I looked into it, and lo and behold, he was right across the bay in San Francisco teaching at uh, the California Institute of Integral Studies, uh, which uh, Jessica had mentioned. And so, and he was teaching in the philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness program. So I just, um, I pretty much within three, mi three months had started the graduate program. Now I had my master's degree, so I entered the doctoral program with actually not necessarily the intention of getting my doctorate. It was just, I wanted to study, I wanted to learn, I wanted to expand my mind. Now, as far as astrology went, I didn't enter the program because of astrology. This was pre his book, Cosmos and Psyche. It was just, it was more his philosophical understanding of, of our world that I felt like I really needed to understand. So um, I entered into the program and all of a sudden I found myself in classes um, 
uh, for instance, called like ancient mystery religions and towards a new worldview. And one of the courses was called Psyche and Cosmos, uh, which ended up being an archetypal astrology course taught by Rick Tarnas. And so that's when I was just suddenly it was like my man, mind started expanding. And I also found myself a part of a larger community where astrology was a common language, where, you know, I'd go to parties and so the person next to me would be talking about their experience of Saturn conjunct their Pluto, you know, transiting Saturn conjunct their natal Pluto. And, and, and it was just on in layers upon layers upon layers. And I was just so excited and so stimulated. And, and so that's when I, essentially embarked uh, on studying astrology, although the year before I had started taking formal courses, but being in that graduate program, I took any class I could uh, related to astrology and and took all the classes I needed for my doctorate. Um, But I never uh, completed my doctorate and what they call all but dissertation. Um, So, and then when, uh, but I did have the intention of doing a doctorate actually, once I got in there and I was really excited about it, but (laughs) I fell in love (laughs) and and life tends to take one on a different course. You know, I just, um, and I am the kind of, my personality is, I just surrender. I truly surrender to my heart and to my passions and, and allow them to guide me because I have so learned that whatever I mentally construct, uh, any strategizing, any projecting into the future, it's probably going to change. And, and I just am, and it turns out that I am so much more empowered by following my heart. So, um, I did fall in love. And this is, as Jessica mentioned, this was Chris Bache. Uh, he had moved out to the Bay area to, to actually get a job for a couple of years. So he had moved out from the East Coast. Now this is, I'm realizing I'm getting much longer than I had intended. (laughs) It's (laughs) a great story. No, I want to hear all this. This is awesome. (laughs) So anyway, so, well, to try to wrap it up, but um, so he, uh, he was in the Bay area and we actually dated for a couple of years uh, for two years. He was working as the director of the Institute of noetic sciences. However, he kept his position at Youngstown State University in Northeast Ohio, not thinking that he was going to go back there, but uh, it was really for his uh, retirement purposes in the end. Well, after a couple of years, he decided that he really missed teaching, uh, hugely missed teaching and teaching undergraduates. So he decided that he really wanted to go back to Northeast Ohio and his position in the philosophy and religious studies department there uh, and and resume teaching his classes. And so I decided to move with him. And and my intention at the time was to work on my dissertation because I was at that point in my career there. But but when I landed in Ohio, I realized, wow, uh, there's a real life out here. There are real people out here. Um, And at that point, I had had such a humongous, which I will not say how large it was, but after having gone to graduate school in the Bay Area for so many years, my debt was just was just off the was way out there, um, frighteningly so. And so when I landed in Ohio in the Midwest, I realized, wow, I needed to get grounded in the real world, you know, the world that people are actually living. And I really needed, felt, you know, sort of, you know, the Saturnian uh, pull of taking responsibility for my debt. And and so I I just, I actually just stepped to the side and, and rather than continuing the dissertation work, I decided to get a full-time job, salaried job with health benefits and all of that, and ended up getting into uh, becoming a career counselor um, and then eventually directing, directing the po- program. And this was at the public university, Youngstown State University. So I did that for 15 years. And uh, pretty much until my humongous loan was forgiven um, after working for a public um, institution or a nonprofit institution for so long, eventually it got forgiven. So I was able to step down and do, you know, a quote unquote uh, early retirement and then um, and really focus on full time astrology, which is really where my passion is. And uh, but in the meantime, I started studying evolutionary astrology 
and uh, through Kim Marie Weimer at evolutionaryastrology.net. And um, it was a phenomenal uh, learning experience. Uh, and after oh, about five years, I got certified as an evolutionary astrologer. And just before that, I also got uh, certified uh, doing past life regression therapy because I was very interested in looking at the correlation between people's actual past life experiences in session with their charts. And um, so around 2013, 2014, I sort of, I just had this flash of an idea. It's kind of a uranium thing, this flash of an idea that somebody out there has done these correlations. Somebody out there has done the research of past life experiences with their charts. And so I went online and sure enough, there was a book out there um, by Patricia Walsh calling um, Understanding Karmic Complexes. And um, because she had done the research, she's done thousands of uh, past life sessions, and she was an evolutionary astrologer. So to kind of learn the correlation, I, I took her program. It was a three-year program. Um, and, and that's actually how I got introduced to evolutionary astrology. I really hadn't heard it before then. So um, so I simultaneously became uh, certified as an evolutionary astrologer and certified as a, um, they call it deep memory uh, practitioner. Um, I think that's what, why I'm kind of spacing out what it's called, but um, deep memory process practitioner. And um, so now I'm doing it all full time and it's super exciting. And um, I'm really appreciative of Jessica who has, um, connected me with some clients and um yeah that's my story <laughs> <laughs> that's so awesome christina i mean just you know right there with patricia walsh it's she lives right like yes part-time or half half the year here mm -hmm. uh, in sarasota where i am yes. so that's an interesting connection to place and um you know, as you were sharing, I'm just looking at your, your birth chart and transits for um, anybody who would like to see Christina's chart as we talk, because I know some of you really like that to ground everything. Christina, would you mind just sharing your, your birth info with everybody? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's April 5th, 1956, uh, Chicago, Illinois, 1028 AM uh, Central Time. So, um, you know, oh, go ahead. Did you want to say something? No, no, that's it. That's it. Okay. Um, uh, before we have you, uh, introduce our topic for today, I just wanted to say just two things that stood out, you know, in, in, in 95, um, when you had ended your, your master's program and you, uh, then really discovered Rick through passion and, and all of that, um, as, as I'm sure you're aware was your Uranus opposition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, it wasn't just your Uranus opposition, but Uranus and Neptune were conjunct in Capricorn as they were through most of the nineties. And mm -hmm. you're born with Uranus square Neptune in your birth mm -hmm. chart, really tight a degree. Of course you have Mars there, um, mm -hmm. forming uh, a T square. And, and I would posit actually a, a grand cross, uh, with your sun, Mercury and Aries, I see you as being a Grand Cross, Sun, Mercury, Kazemi, uh, with opposite Neptune, and then square both Uranus and Mars. And when uh, you came into astrology at the Uranus opposition, which is quite common for people, just Uranus's relationship to astrology, but that radical breakthrough into a new world and and new ideas. Um, and then, but but with Uranus Neptune there, it was such a spiritual awakening and mm -hmm. a revolution of consciousness. And um, you clearly were always meant <laughs> to, to be an astrologer and, and mm -hmm. to, to discover this path. And I just love it when that archetypal complex that you're born with and then it happens in the sky right on where it was you're born. It was just the perfect timing, mm -hmm. you know, for that to happen. And then just the other thing I wanted to mention there was uh, when you were talking about following your heart, and how, you know, you just finally realized that you had to, you know, you were empowered through following your heart and your desire and love. For me, that's just really capturing the quality of Pluto squaring your Venus in your birth chart mm -hmm. and just the, the, the transformational power of both love in your life and relationship, mm -hmm. which clearly happened with you and Chris, but that you 
through following your heart, your desire, Venus, that's really where you become empowered and are able to go on the transform transformative journey, which so clearly you love and value, which is, you know, Venus loving and valuing uh, the Plutonic depths and, and, mm -hmm. and what happens there um, mm -hmm. when you allow yourself to surrender and, and be taken. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. Thank you, Jess. I really appreciate that. And talk about um, surrendering and being taken, you know, and loving the uh, death and rebirth process. Of course, I'm, I'm an Aries son, so I love the, you know, the, the emergence of new life from the death, too. <laughs> and, um, and the one thing I had failed to mention that is so, like, as you said, you know, so the Uranus square Neptune uh, in, or in a T-square with Mars and then Uranus opposite during that time. The one thing that, um, that really cracked open my consciousness in a way, I mean, I thought I was going to the philosophy, cosmology and consciousness program, you know, to expand my mind, to understand philosophy and, and, mm. you know, and, and sort of the, the particular worldview and it, from a, from the perspective, from a spiritual perspective of, of the evolution of consciousness, you know, through time going back to the Greeks or the Babylonians actually, so that's what I, and I did, and, and that was wonderful um, about the program, but there's also another layer of that program, which was a complete surprise, and that was the sacred medicine work. That wasn't mm -hmm. actually in the program, but that's how I got introduced to it. And, you know, the first steps was being introduced to Stan Groff's work of, you know, the perinatal complex, and then eventually getting introduced to sacred medicine um, work and as a way to expand consciousness. And that was really, if anything, that really not only cracked open my mind, but just uh, the power of my heart. I mean, the love of going into that space is just, I mean, I, I always said that's where I feel most at home is when mm. I go into that space. Mm. And uh, yeah. Huh. It's just so interesting. As you talk, I can feel this thing happening in, in my awareness and my consciousness, which is, you know, you're born at the Uranus square Neptune from mm -hmm. the mid fifties. And then I'm born at the beginning of the conjunction mm -hmm. 1987, but mm -hmm. I was, you know, if, you know, using Rick's orbs of influence of that 15 degrees for world transits. It's like, I'm mm -hmm. born at the very beginning wave of the conjunction after your waning square. Mm -hmm. And, and then on top of that, both of our Saturns are in Sagittarius. So uh -huh. the safety right before we get on, I, I am your Saturn return. Right. <laughs> and, yeah. and so as you talk and because you were in the program bef many, many years before I came in, I didn't even, I came to San Francisco in 2007, but I didn't start officially studying until 2008 with Rick Mm -hmm. Um, it's like, I can feel the way that the mm, morphogenetic field of everything that you and your generation, both in your born in 56, but also you and your generation as my predecessor within, you know, the lineage and the program that I came into and everything that you were doing and everything you were discovering and everything that you were forging mm -hmm. through. And then I come in and like, I'm picking up on that waveform or that torch, mm -hmm. you know, of all the work that you did with sacred medicine and all the work that you did with the worldview and, and, and astrology. And now here I am, you know, um, a decade plus later from when that journey started for me and, you know, uh, what, two, two, two and a half decades for you. And we're sitting here having this conversation. It's just so wild. I love the way mm -hmm. that karma and time, mm -hmm. you know, work work together in that really mysterious way. That's right. Yeah, the cycles of time are just fascinating to study. Um, and seeing the linkages of the the development and the the growth of the collective field as mm -hmm. we as individuals enter into it and kind of spark things. So I, I really get what you're saying. That That's really neat. Hmm. Well, I was thinking uh, it would be great for you if you wanted to to just maybe share what some of your thoughts were about what we could discuss today. You proposed a topic and it made me excited yeah. and okay, whatever, whatever you want to do with that or wherever you want to go is fine with me. Okay. Well, talking about expanding consciousness, I'm, I do, I'm, I'm super excited to speak about uh, the Saturn Uranus symbiosis, um, how they work together to expand consciousness. 
Um, I have a moon in Aquarius. So as I'm sure most many of the listeners know, uh, Saturn and Uranus both, they, they co-rule Aquarius. And um, so I've been just fascinated with the interface between Saturn and Uranus. Uh, and so the, the first piece I just want to, I want to start off with kind of entering our, ourselves into the solar system. Okay. So, you know, basically grounding ourselves in the astronomy of our solar system, system to really kind of get on a physical ex- inner experiential level of the relationship between Saturn and Uranus uh, before we talk about how it is impacting us collectively and individually. Um, so, and it just reinforces the, the direct relationship between the macrocosm of the solar system and the microcosm of our lives. So let's begin with the macrocosm. Uh, and so if you could, uh, close your eyes and imagine the solar system in your mind's eye. Okay. Imagine that you're at the center of the solar system and beginning with the sun and then moving out to Mercury, holding the whole solar system in your mind's eye. And then we're moving to Venus and then the earth and then the moon going around the earth and then Mars and then Jupiter and then expanding into Saturn. And let's hold that image as Saturn is the outer edge of the visible planets um, in, you know, since ancient Babylonian times, which was about, I don't know, give or take, of course, um, hundreds of years, 2000 BC to 1600 BC, humans were constantly following the planets, um, the, the inner planets uh, from Mercury, well, from the sun, um, through Mercury, through Saturn, because they could see them with their, with their eyesight, with one of their five senses. And so they, they tracked their movements and they, they made correlations between the movements, movements in the heavens and their experiences on, on earth. Um, and it wasn't until around March, 1781, when after the telescope was discovered that the next planet beyond Saturn was seen, was actually seen again with our eyes, but we're using, you know, a telescope to be able to see it. So they, and then they recognized that they, they, that this planet beyond Saturn was as far away from the, from Saturn as Saturn was far away from the sun. So imagine, you know, when you're living in a world where Saturn is the outer limits of your world then suddenly your world doubles, right? And this is in the 18th century. So it was it was quite shocking. It was, you know, just like going into a sacred medicine experience or, you know, even following the planets now. It's just really mind-shaking to experience the expansion of our consciousness and the, expan- and the expansion of our worlds. So um, this planet was eventually named Uranus, uh, based upon the god Uranus in classical mythology. Uh, this was because Uranus was the father of Saturn. Okay, at the time it was called Kronos. And uh, Uranus, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, I'm not sure. Um, but he was also the god of, you know, he was called the god of the starry sky. So, and Uranus, because I'm probably not pronouncing this correctly, is spelled O U R A N. O-S, Oranos, maybe that's how it is. So Saturn is the last of the inner planets, and Uranus is the first planet of the outer, or what's also called transpersonal planets, which, you know, the beginning of Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. So a significant demarcation between Saturn and Uranus in our solar system. Um, So I'm very interested in the symbiosis between those two planets, so, one second, I gotta take a glass of water here. Yeah, I just, I love that word. I was just underlining symbiosis as far as their relationship goes. I just think, yeah, like you're saying that they both rule Aquarius, but also, yeah, this this relationship that they have that one comes after the other and then and this process that you're describing, I think it's a perfect word for it. Yeah, thank you, thanks. 
Um, I'll actually be talking more about the symbiosis at some point. Um, but right now, I just want to, I'm going to speak to Saturn, the archetype of Saturn, and then I'll speak to the archetype of Uranus, and then we'll talk about how they connect. So, or how they work together and enhance one another. So, um, I am only going to be referring to one aspect of Saturn at this point to keep it pretty short and, and tight. Um, so I would really like to refer our audience to uh, Jess's, Jessica's article, Revisioning Saturn. She does a wonderful job um, elucidating Saturn from a, um, you know, from a feminine point of view, looking at the patriarchal and then adding the matriarchal or the feminine um, you know, expanding our understanding of Saturn um, in a real holistic kind of way. So again, her article, Revisioning Saturn, is in, it was published in the Archive Journal, which comes out of the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness Program. And um, the, she has it on her website, trustpsyche.com. It's, it's really a delight to read. So um, what I'm going to be talking about here is just a, a very narrow aspect of Saturn, um, which is the, the aspect that is directly dovetail, dovetails with Uranus. Oh, excuse me. So um, the aspect that I want to focus on here is Saturn is the ruler of space and time. It's also the ruler of karma. It is boundaries. It rules including the skin of our bodies on the physical plane. It also rules the cycle boundaries on the psychological and mental planes, such as, you know, especially the psychological and mental uh, is the conditioning factors of the family that we are born into. OK, and the family would include, you know, our parents, uh, if we have them, aunts, uncles, siblings and so on. We're kind of born into this envelope, which which creates which which creates the boundaries of the world of our known world from the time we're born until we are teenagers and then start rebelling and leaving. But as we're within the envelope of the, the conditioning factors of our family, our neighborhood, uh, and including our ancestors and so on, this would um, definitely include our, the beliefs, the fears, the judgments, and the expectations of our family. Um, and again, it does include our ancestors, um, and the sort of the fears and the experiences that were inherited from our parents that were transmitted to us through our parents it is also our economic conditioning. Were you born poor or were you born upper class or anywhere in between? Okay. That gives each individual a different conditioning uh, factors or a different conditioning experience uh, relative to others. It also includes our religious conditioning. You know, were your parents atheist or they were they Baptist? You know, or were they Catholic or were they agnostic? The social conditioning. What role did your plant, parents play in society? How engaged were they? What were their expectations, both spoken and unspoken? And also the political conditioning of one's upbringing. Okay, so Saturn is what we are conscious of due to how we were formed in our childhood. Because of this, despite how dysfunctional it might have been or how functional it might have been, it does give us security. Okay, so Saturn also rules security as it rules space and time. And it does rule our karma, the consequences of our act actions um, that get played out through the cycles of time. Okay. So that's, that's just the one piece that I want to kind of put onto the table around Saturn. And, um, I'm also, now I'm going to move to Uranus, uh, and then, you know, speaking to the archetype of Uranus, uh, Uranus is very different from Saturn, awakens and liberates. It is outside of time. And so it allows one to see the bigger picture oftentimes with a quickness and a charge to it, such that one feels super energized, kind of like when a lightning bolt, you know, you have a storm coming and the air changes around you and, and you can feel, you know, the, the, the winds start picking up and the air, the, the, the quality of the air, the temperature changes. And then the lightning bolt comes in and all of a sudden you see the whole picture, you know, it's like, 
everything was really dark and black prior to it. And suddenly with the lightning bolt, you get the, the whole gestalt in one fraction of a second. That's how Uranus works. Okay. As an air element, it rules the intellect. And yet it acts as the tr trickster that shifts thoughts to outside of the box. It rules innovative thinking. It quickens the mind and brings the sudden insights like, wow, I can't believe I just saw the whole gestalt instantaneously <laughs> like that. <laughs> it can shatter the Saturnian bound consciousness. And this is the relationship. And that this is its, its kind of it, its motivation is to, uh, to shatter the Saturnian bound consciousness that is bound to collective thinking and thus rules the process of individuation. Now, when I speak to collective thinking, this is oftentimes a, I mean, it's a common word in, in society, but in evolutionary astrology, when, when I'm, uh, what, we're, what we tend to refer to, what we mean with collective thinking, or, you know, it's consensus-based thinking. It's like the majority of the collective, the majority of the people, how they operate, the rules that they operate under. It's kind of like in its, it's it can be um, herd based thinking, you know, following what everybody else does, uh, following, you know, the judgments, the prejudices, kind of just in, in making tons of assumptions about how reality is. And again, the reality that one lives in, that is the Saturnian bound consciousness um, of our awareness is very personal based upon our upbringing. But then Uranus comes and it oftentimes, you know, it rules or the, the teenage years when one starts, you know, questioning, one starts kind of thinking outside of the box of one's family. And so it does rule the process of individuation and it shatters the conditioning that no longer serves our soul so that our solar fire can be liberated. So going back to the image of the, the solar system, so you've got, you know, the sun at the center of the solar system, and then you get the planets, and then you have Saturn on the outer um, perimeter, and then Uranus beyond that. So Saturn just it, it takes the you know the the, the space time conditioning, which is can be incredibly tight. It's almost like you know prison walls that we build around ourselves for the purpose of our security and for the purpose of our safety. But it, it does, and, and it serves, the Saturnian consciousness does serve the evolution of each individual consciousness because we need to have security and safety in order to be able to develop. It's like, you know, Jessica, like having the baby in the womb. You need to have mm -hmm. the womb. You need to have the, yeah, the, the protection of, of the, um, the boundaries for the soul to develop. And there comes a point when that soul needs to crack through. It needs to be born. It needs to be liberated out of that particular conditioning that once protected it. Eventually, and this is where, you know, Uranus comes in, it's, it's, it's intent, and this is in combined with Neptune and Pluto, is, is to eventually the soul is strong enough. It's like the scaffolding of that soul and, the, you know, it's, it's, its boundaries are strong enough and, and self-secure enough that it, it doesn't need to rely on other people's beliefs and other people's, you know, conditionings or, or it, it's internally strong enough. It doesn't need to, um, it isn't dependent upon other people's p opinions in order to feel safe and secure. Okay. So Uranus comes in and it just shakes things up uh, in order to reach beyond the personal and into the societal. However, the process of Uranus is to, and this is a very important part of the individuation process of Uranus, is for us as individuals to, um, to discover our unique selves. You know, who are we that are, you know, unique? You know, what is the unique gift that we have that is that no one else has that we can give uh, to distribute, to disseminate, to seed into society. Okay. So that, that is sort of, I think the, in many ways, the spiritual purpose of Uranus is cracking the boundaries between the conscious mind and the, and the limited conscious mind to allow the soul to evolve, to, to recognize that first, if the earlier layers that one, 
that one's world, that one is so much more than one's family and one's neighborhood and one's community, you know, that there's a country and, and so much more than one's our country, you know, that there are other countries, you know, there's an international system with different cultures and different ways of eating and, and so on and so on. So if you have a, a Iranian individual, they oftentimes just are totally inspired by traveling and, and experiencing different cultures because it is the, the you know, it, it inspires their minds to be much broader than who they are individually. Um, and it, it also liberates from dual consciousness, you know, the black and white thinking of either or. Um, and the, this is how, you know, through expansion, one recognizes there are, that there are so many different subtle realities out there and so many different other worldviews um, out there that are equally as valid as one's own individual worldview. And I would like to propose, and this is actually not me proposing it. I mean, uh, one of my favorite thinkers is Dane Rugier, and he's, he really um, lays this out where it, it's around, it's, you know, Uranus's purpose is to, to shift the personal solar consciousness into the recognition that there are, you know, billions of other stars out there or billions of other suns out there, you know, into the recognition that there's, there's even way more than just our solar system. You know, there's, there's billions of other solar systems out there just as there are billions of other individuals with incredibly unique creative gifts um, here, you know, that are here to serve society and the liberation of society. So, um, so Uranus does um, also uh, symbolize or represent or correspond, it's probably a better word to say, one's community and tribe of like-minded people and friends too. Um, the last, one other thing I want to say about Uranus, uh, it, so it, it also, and I don't know if this is just evolutionary astrology or if this is kind of common in astrological lingo, but, uh, Uranus rules. So it's, again, it, it, it's the individual, it, since it's beyond space and time, it rules the individual's sort of connection to their past lives as well as their future lives that are not yet, you know, played out yet. And so when Uranus comes in, one can, one's mind, one can have incredible insights of either a past life or of the future. Okay. So it's, um, it, it can bring in a certain kind of clairvoyance, um, which is part of the, the ability to see the whole picture. Yeah. So I've, I've definitely, I've heard of Uranus's connection with this like precognitive ability that's like high mind, high intuition yeah. to see things in that way. But I haven't ever heard about its connection specifically with past and future lives and that that's part of what's happening in the, the insight or the awakening or the transmission or download that's taking place mm -hmm. when, say, you get a transit of it. I, I, I think that's unique to evolutionary astrology. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks. I appreciate that. I, I wasn't sure like how much, if that was common, sort of part mm. of the common lingo or not. Mm. Um, now, as Uranus rules uh, the 11th house, or that there's a correlation between 11th house and one's um, sort of one's vision, you know, it's, it, it can bring in sort of the vision of the future. Um, and uh, and then what they like to say in evolutionary astrology is like, you, you know, if you get the vision like three times or more, then it's usually probably real uh, mm -hmm. rather than sort of a fleeting thought that you're grabbing from the collective consciousness. Um, now, Neptune rules collective consciousness. So Uranus is much more, you know, as part of the individuation process, very much the, the timeline of the individual. Mm -hmm. um, so... Yeah, I mean that's it's it's fascinating to me just what you're saying about how you know if we uh, what I often call like the structural poetics of the cosmos. So you're talking about how for a long time Saturn was the known edge of our universe or our cosmos, and then when Uranus was discovered, mm -hmm. it it doubled the size mm -hmm. of of our world, so to speak. Yeah, and the the structural poetics of the fact that that's happening on a physical structural level within our solar system 
Um, but that archetypally, symbolically, what it represents is that correspondence of radical breakthrough and beyond uh, the personal, beyond what we've known, beyond the boundaries and the containers. And that, of course, therefore, Uranus ends up symbolizing those qualities. And it's just a beautiful way how on a very kind of physical level, the evolutions that we go through, let's say as a human species and our understanding of the world around us, then also maps to that more psycho-spiritual, imaginal and symbolic level of, yeah, and that's what exactly that planet does for us, Mm -hmm. Um, especially when we go through transits of it. It takes us beyond the boundaries, beyond the known world, and all the ways that you're describing um, Saturn relating to the family and society, tradition and norms and rules. And Uranus is there to break us out of that and that there's a uh, evolutionary intent in doing so. And what I, what I appreciate about what you're drawing out is that when that happens in our life, it's because our soul is ready for that, that we're strong enough in our psyche to be able to handle going beyond what it is that we've already known. And I think that kind of approach to understanding this relationship of Saturn and Uranus is very healing because it's a more empowered position to take when the disruption and potentially chaos comes into our lives and we're forced to look at things in a different way and to make those changes, which often can be quite difficult or ego dystonic. And this, I think, points to the word symbiosis that you're bringing in is like, No, there's a reason these two follow one another. There's a reason it goes sadder than Uranus. And there's a reason why it happens from an evolutionary perspective in this unfolding. And if we can, if we can trust that and if we Mm -hmm. can surrender to that, Mm -hmm. actually we help not only align with our soul's purpose and that vision that Uranus brings in, but we actually eliminate unnecessary suffering Mm -hmm. in, in our individuation process. Yes. That is exactly right. And that's where I think astrology is incredibly inspiring um, because you, you, once you sort of understand how the universe works i mean even in the, the with our limited knowledge of what we understand now it, it does it, it you see the incredible intelligence just kind of woven through our lives and how they're connected to this much larger universe that we're a part of and then of course the divine that that governs all of it um the thing with saturn is is you know the reason why we have those boundaries is because of the safety and the security and um, so it can be very fear-based when all of a sudden our world starts, you know, getting rattled, uh, seriously rattled, as, as it is now collectively with Uranus in uh, Taurus, another Earth sign. Within, um, so it, it, it can be terrifying. And yet when one, and, and of course the body will respond as terrified when things get, come, when, when one loses a loved one or one gets this sort of sudden surprise of, you know, one moment one's life is a certain way, and then the next moment the life is is, is, is suddenly very different, and you, there's no way of going back to the previous life. Uh, that's really scary. It's it's scary territory to be in, and yet at the same time, while we're on it, honoring the fear, it is important to surrender to the new that is being asked to emerge. Uh, and it can be guaranteed that it will be brilliant if we can ride the forces that are running through us um, with Uranus's uh, correspondence and, and triggering um, our energies uh, to shift our worlds around us. I think it's important to underline the guarantee that it will be brilliant. I yeah. think that often yes. we, we need to have the the why to endure what's happening to us Mm -hmm. and when we're in that very real physiological primal response of fear that's Mm -hmm. hardwired in our nervous system and in our brains it's like for me we need to be able to have even just momentarily a sense of there is something on the other side of this and that quality of of rebirth that you're on is promises when we are able to surrender and ride that wave as you're saying and that it's 
the rebirth itself is defined by this, this brilliance. And it, it, at the end of the day, it always is worth it to surrender and to go through it. Mm-hmm. It's just that every time it's an initiation that requires the Saturnian death to take place. And because Death is hardwired into us to be something to be afraid of and to fear and to resist out of a survival instinct. It's it's challenging every single time to do so. And when you bring it to that macro collective level, uh, as you know, now with Saturn square Uranus in the sky and everything that's happening in the world, it's like, yeah. whoa, like when you sit in meditation and you allow yourself to feel like all the psyches as much as possible and what every Mm -hmm. individual person is going through right now. And the fact that we're 8 billion people, the magnitude of that and the the level of convulsion that's happening, Mm -hmm. it's something that no human has ever had to feel or face before because it's never been at this scale. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. It can be terrifying uh, what's going on in the world right now. Uh, As you mentioned, the last quarter square, in fact, you know, a relationship between Saturn and Uranus and Saturn, you know, coming very, very close to the last quarter square and then retrograding back backwards. um, It actually two weeks after its retrograde, it, it started its retrograde motion uh, this is when we had the uh, George Floyd incident. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And so, and then as, so it, it was also in evolutionary astrology and the probably astrology in general, there is bet- before you got to the actual last quarter square is the biceptile moment and, um, or the biceptile relationship. And in particular with Saturn and Uranus. So, so the septile is dividing the circle of the 360 degree wheel in, into seven segments. Okay, the squares is four segments. So you have four segments, five segments, six segments, seven sevens. So this is the, the actually the biceptile, uh, this, the particular relationship of Saturn and Uranus is like the fifth septile. It's called a biceptile. Um, in the fifth sort of septile in relationship to the seven septiles in a 360 degree wheel. So, but the, the quality of that energy, well, first of all, in evolutionary astrology, uh, and I'm pretty sure that this is based on D- Dane Rudier's work uh, that Jeffrey Green has kind of expanded upon, but it really comes from Dane Rudier, is the septile is fate, okay? So when you, when you have like a septile relationship in your personal chart, um, between two planets, it's it, there's like a fadedness quality to those two planets in the sense that those two planets, um, if you're not following, if you, if you end up in your life make, making choices that take you off your evolutionary intention, okay, that it's like fate will come in and ensure that you get back on track. Mm-hmm. Or sometimes we pre-program a certain faded moments in our lives that will, you know, it, it, it's like pre-programmed to make sure that we kind of take the direction, uh, it, you know, that we move into a different direction than what, you know, are, you know, sort of kind of like fin- finishing up karmic business. And it's like at a certain point in our lives, we kind of have to move in a different direction. It's like, OK, done, done with that karma. Let's let's shift you in a different direction. And then people or circumstances will occur that will help guide us in that new direction. And so we're in this biceptile moment, um, and it's in the disseminating phase of this 360 degree wheel, which is all about society. Um, so, and it's all about shifting the energy of society. So, in in some ways, the way that I look at the, um, you know, the horror of the George Floyd moment when um, I can't remember. Oh yeah. Derek Chauvin, the Minneapolis policeman got, you know, put his, had his knee on George Floyd's neck for eight minutes. And the images of that, that just got transmitted around the world instantaneously, it created a shock wave that is so Uranus Saturn, you know, it, it shocked us out of our collective sum- slumber, which is Saturnian collectively that we kind of went into this unconsciousness of sort of, yeah, we're aware of 
uh, racial inequity. We're aware of, yeah, the poor, that there are, there's a whole, the elite, you know, that have really, um, that are really subsuming, taking all of the, the, the money in the world. And yet at the same time, it, it's sort of like we needed a greater shock than the, the kind of awareness that we were kind of floating in at that moment in time. Um, so it's, and, and, and I'd like to go back to, you know, the founding fathers of the United States who were very Iranian. They were geniuses who, you know, established the democratic ideal, which is actually Iranian, where, where, every, where the people have their voice and there's equality. It's a very Aquarian uh, energy. They created a republic, or, you know, the United States, based upon the principles of equality and the natural rights of of, you know, natural rights tradition. Of course, it wasn't everyone because they didn't include women and they didn't include blacks at the time. But this, by keeping in mind, this emerged out of the um, 18th century consciousness. So Saturnian consciousness that was very dense uh, in 1776. So we've had 244 years plus to align our principles with our practices. You know, so our principles is the Ju- Jupiterian um, with our practices, which is Saturn. And we have had collective waves of attempts since then, you know, most notably the first being the Civil War and its reconstruction. And then the second being the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. And then another being the election and the re-election of our country's first and thus far black, you know, only black president. And then the Black Lives Matters movement. However, each enormous effort has been followed by periods of collective numbing again and, and attempts to normalize, which is Saturn, right? And so then on May 26, when Saturn is retrograde at this biceptile phase, getting ready to get into its last quarter phase, you know, we have this image of this Minneapolis policeman with his knee on the neck of a, of a you know, black man uh, killing him. And it actually, it stimulated what it, I was doing a little bit of Wikipedia research. And um, apparently it stimulated the largest protest in the United States history with an estimated 15 to 26 million people participating in demonstrations. Okay. And that's just in the United States. That doesn't include, you know, the international demonstrations that were happening. So it, I really see that moment as a real Iranian shakeup to the uh, Saturnian numbing of um, the, the horror of the inequities, the, the racial inequities of our society. Um, and that we can't go backwards, you know? We're not gonna, there, there's no way we can go back into the collective numbing again. So then, um, so then you have Saturn, you know, going retrograde back and then eventually it'll be, boy, one thing I just wanna say, so, the disseminating phase is a yin phase when it hits and when it starts getting closer and closer to the last quarter square. And I, and Jessica, I know I, I use tighter orbs than you do. You're, you're, yes. you're probably still within your last quarter yes. square orb. Um, but when it shifts from the yin phase to the yang phase, wow, watch out when it enters the last quarter square phase um, that is called, you know, crises in consciousness. Um, and it makes the transition throughout uh, 2021 um, into the last quarter phase. If we we're going to use, and I'm using kind of fairly exact uh, orbs. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I think, you know, we're, we're really being collectively shook so that the, the webs of unconsciousness are being yanked away uh, so that we can see more clearly what is actually happening in mm-hmm. society. Mm-hmm. There's so much of um, what you're saying that is evoking in me. And I think one thing that I think would be interesting to do in another stream would to be have a conversation about orbs and okay. to like really talk about like why you use the orbs you use, why I use the ones I use. And again, orbs are um, the, the time period that we see an aspect operative, whether that's in the world transits the birth chart or the personal transits. And I just think it would be really fascinating for us to understand that because something that I hear evolutionary astrology doing, I think a lot more is um, really focusing on the phases. And it's not just the, 
the main phases, but you, you know, the way that you understand, um, you know, like bringing in the, the septile, it's like, yeah, yeah, I don't work with that at all. And then like the way that you're talking about the disseminating phases, yin, it's like, wow, okay. I need to understand, you know, exactly like where, where is that coming from in you? Cause what you're saying, I mean, it really resonates and it connects to my experience of what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. But anyways, I, that, I think that's another stream, but I think, you know, with staying with this, it's like something that you're saying is, and I actually, I, I have to do a Saturn thing here. So we're, we're nearing the hour, but I'm really loving what we're doing. Is it okay if we keep going? Sure. Totally. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Okay, Capricorn. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm I see it. I want to honor it. And I'm going to do a Uranus and I'm going to break it. Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> so, so I think part of what you're saying here for me around the Saturn collective numbing and the, the, the relationship that Saturn has to our safety and our security is and in particular with this example with George Floyd and Black Lives Matter is just like, it just feels like in the tradition of the United States, so much of the safety and the security has been around racism. Like racism has been a part of the security of those who are in power, you know, the white, mm -hmm. white supremacy. It's yeah. like you, ha you, you have to have had racism in order for the United States to have built so much wealth and power that it did mm -hmm. in its early years because of slavery and that quote unquote free labor, which obviously wasn't free to the slaves, but was free to the white owners. Mm -hmm. And that literally the foundation of American wealth and prosperity was built upon slavery and racism. And so to dismantle that and to face that in a Uranian way to go beyond that and to look at that, to break out of that safety and security of the past and truly where, you know, this, the history Saturn lies within this country, what you're asking people to do is it's like, uh, what did Martin Luther King say? He said, it's one thing to say that a black person can come in to your diner and you sit next to them and have a burger. It's another thing for you to be willing to share your wealth with them. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to money mm -hmm. and land, mm -hmm. are you going to actually be willing to share that? Mm -hmm. that that is what true racial equality and equity looks like mm -hmm. and i just think the numbing it's like america has had to be to be numb to it so that the part of the population that got to live the quote unquote american dream and own land and have <laughs> health uh, benefits and mm -hmm. social security mm -hmm could keep living their life and having it mm -hmm. at the expense of all the people who never, ever, ever, ever had it. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I, I think that's a, it's, a, it's it, I think it speaks to the level of the convulsion. Mm -hmm. And like you're saying, when your Uranus transit comes in and it hits the Saturn piece, and it's like, you keep saying there's no going back. And I think, I think yeah, that's the very nature of it. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, there's no going back. And as long as you keep trying to go back, you're just going to accrue greater and greater suffering mm -hmm. and greater and greater karma mm -hmm. that is mm, uh, <laughs> dark, you know? I want to say even evil. It's like it carries a quality to it. It's like, how are you going to redeem that? You know, mm -hmm. how are you going to? How can, how dare you fall asleep, back asleep after this moment? Right. right. Hmm. Precisely. Yeah. How dare one go back to sleep after this moment? It's not going to happen. It's, I think people are going to die. People are going to get sick, uh, extremely sick. Uh, just like you said, with the karma of um, the, the consequences of actions of trying to go back is just going to be so extreme uh, that I, I have a fit in some ways, the extremity of it may shift people 
into their their place of their places of their greatest fears. Like you, you hit it on the nail right around the, you know, the, the money, you know, it's like, yeah, it's a whole nother thing to share our, our, you know, quote unquote wealth um, with the minority groups who have not been able to share in it, you know, equally with us. Um, those boundaries need to be dissolved. Uh, and I, I trust will be dissolved. I saw this amazing video and actually, I don't remember if you shared it or not, but it was of this woman this African-American woman, you know, and it was like in the process when the protests were like really high and people were, you know, talking about like destruction of property and stuff. And she just got up there and she was like, what do you people are like? How dare, you know, how come the African-American community is destroying their own neighborhoods? And she's like, how dare you? She's like, do you think we own any of this? We don't own a single brick yeah. in any of these buildings. Mm hmm. None of this is ours. It's never been ours. You've never let us have any of it. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's one of the most dehumanizing and humiliating and, again, evil thing to do to someone yeah. where on the surface you're like, Yo, you can vote, uh, you can have a job. Mm -hmm. But but you're but not getting paid nearly as much. You're not going to get paid. Yeah, you're not going to get paid. You're not going to have health insurance. And you're definitely not going to have the accumulation of wealth that's passed down through generations. I mean, mm -hmm. how far ahead that white Americans are than any person of color as far as their inheritance of land and wealth, the, the extreme amount ahead of generations that they are, that the African-American community and, and people of color will it, never, it's impossible for them to ever catch up, let alone like the way that nepotism works in our society where you know, talk about the tradition of Saturn. It's not just land and wealth that people inherit, but like the social network of people's connections mm -hmm. to get jobs. Yes. I see. And it's just like mm -hmm. all America upper class is built upon nepotism and the, who you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and that gets you in the door, whether that's to an Ivy League school or to some, you know, corporate job. Yeah. You know, interestingly, it's, as you talk about the nepotism, I didn't realize how integral it was in our society until we got Trump into office. And it's just like in our face every single day. I mean, it, it's become so transparent um, it's because of his high level of unconsciousness. He doesn't even have the, you know, it just he, he has the inability to try to hide it. Um, I think this really relates to the piece of Saturn Uranus. Like you were mentioning how Uranus relates to democracy. And I think this is part of, I think, why Saturn Uranus to me is the most paradoxical out of all the aspects mm -hmm. is it's like Saturn Uranus can be a time period where there's the end of democracy, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it can be the maturation mm -hmm. of democracy. Mm-hmm. And that it's simultaneously Absolutely. both those things are happening. Yeah. Right. And it's like Trump just made a decision to essentially dismantle the U.S. postal system. Oh. And for the election, I'm sure. Right. But, for the election, uh, you know, so that, right, the ballots can't get in, you know, it's just like, okay, that's the end. That's a gesture towards an end of democracy. Yeah. Right. And it's like, for what? And, and like you're saying, that nepotism, it's like he will do anything at any cost to keep his wealth and at this point stay out of jail. Mm -hmm. And and who does he appoint to run the U.S. postal system now? A guy who has all of his and like I think somewhere between 30 and 60 million dollars of investments in FedEx and UPS. Oh, yeah. Oh. So it's like, okay. Okay. Same old story, but just right now, you know, shockingly in our face, which is shockingly. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and the, but the, but the, that is the dismantling that's happened. That's the Iranian dismantling, you know, and then we, of course we have Pluto conjunct Saturn, which is just completely, you know, you know, uh, it, it, dismantling is a different word. It's like transmuting and it, it's heightening the anxiety level as well with having Pluto in there. Uh, conjunct Saturn uh, and and really transmuting the the patriarchal structures and and of you know the, especially the the authority and control and 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 so on. But then 
You have Uranus in there kind of, you know, sort of really shaking things up to an extreme degree and really cracking those prison walls that we've all lived in of the Mm -hmm. patriarchal, you know, hierarchical, you know, above versus below. And then, you know, moving us into the the Aquarian age as, you know, Saturn is now is going to be moving into the Aquarian age. And, um, and, and this is, you know, what I'm so excited about too, is that part of, you know, the, the democratic ideal is, you know, everyone, you know, that there's equality and then you have the Iranian of, of the uniqueness, you know, the, the recognition of the uniqueness of each in, individual and yes, and yet honoring equality and, and moving into a whole new collective way of being. Um, and, and, you know, what comes to mind actually is, is we were talking about this is, you know, I had been in the military eons ago when I, after I graduated from high school wow. and yeah, and one of the, um, the, the, there were two things I walked away from with it. Well, three things. One of it was, I hated the, being in the military, but <laughs> one of them was, was the, the incredible power of working together and the military has got that down. It's just like you're, you know, you're part of your team. And yeah, there is a hierarchy, you know, with the sergeant, you know, we're all, I was basic, you know, pre-sergeant, what do you call it? Enlisted level. This was pre-college. And so we were all, but but we were all working together and the power of working together and being part of a team. And so... Um, and, and so there is something around the Aquarian sort of the equality and, and honoring and recognize the uniqueness within the equality and working together as a team. Um, I think, you know, it, with time, of course, it's going to take time and a lot of shattering of the old systems before we things can reconstruct themselves in a way where we can, as inspired individuals, really work together to empower one another and um, and be so much more empowered than the old hierarchical system. Um, so I kind of see that that that's where part of the Iranian sort of shake up you know, Uranus and Taurus, you know, shaking up these prison walls. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's where I see hmm. it's heading. Hmm. One of I the- love it. Yeah, I love that. No, it's I, it actually gives me so much hope. And again, that piece of the why to endure the suffering that you know happens when uh, the old structures have been outgrown, and it's like we're at the point with Saturn where we've reached the limit of this container, and uh, mm-hmm. our collective soul is ready as you're putting forward to move beyond this. And there's a lot of suffering in that process because, as we know, Saturn can resist the change of Uranus. Mm -hmm. It can oppress the change of Uranus, Mm -hmm. um, uh, right? Or, or it can become, uh, the change of Uranus and the difference between those two creates very different timeline realities for every individual. And now for us Mm -hmm. collectively, you know, when change, when the Iranian, uh, quest moment comes in to move into a new future, if we resist that versus we embrace that, Mm-hmm. You you have two very different timeline outcomes. Um, so mm-hmm. I'm just wondering in, in our remaining time, if, if there's anything else that you wanted to share either personally or collectively about, about Saturn or Uranus or anything else at all that just feels well, they, like it wants to come through. <laughs> there is one more thing that is coming through real strongly. And this, this I had seen in a sacred medicine journey many, 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 many years ago around the relationship of Saturn and Uranus. And, and it really resonated with me. I don't know if it's going to resonate with other people, but it's, 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 it, it showed me, you know, crystalline consciousness, which I'm so into. So there's, it, it showed me crystals and it reminded me because in my bachelor's degree, it's, we studied mineralogy and it reminded me the, the, of the atomic structure of every single crystal or every single, single, you know, mineral is, is different. You know, they, 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 they each have, they're all within sort of families, if you will, but the, the way that the atomic structure is configured is the Saturnian structure that gives form to the crystal and the crystal, the, the form the, the, that we love so much about minerals and crystals is the light shining through the form. And that's mm-hmm. the Iranian side of it. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's sort of like, yeah, so sat, you know, so it really, uh, I, I think drove home for me the importance of Saturn 
in, in its ability to hold the structure together and, and the uniqueness of the structure. And then, of mm. course, the Iranian light coming through to just, you know, to, to bring it to its ultimate brilliance of what it is. Oh, my God. I love that. I think that's mm. awesome. Mm-hmm. I think that that I hope that is written down and, and, and there's an image that you have that goes along with it and under crystalline consciousness, like that's part of the the vision statement. Cause mm-hmm. I just think that's just an incredible image and, mm-hmm. you know, connecting it back to what you said earlier about there being, you know, this, this soul inside of mm-hmm. my belly right now. Yeah. I think, you know, the way that I think about, motherhood in my best approximation uh, before this being comes out and I spend the rest of my life with her is I feel like my role, my, my duty, my karmic contract that I have signed up for is to be the container Mm -hmm. and the space holder Mm -hmm. for her consciousness Mm -hmm. to bring whatever light in all the light in that she will. And that my job is to help, expand that container along every stage of development alongside with her until death do us part in the physical form. And that my job in order to bring in, help her facilitate, bring in the most amount of light that she can from her soul in and through that container is to help hold that container in a sound, safe, secure way Mm -hmm. while simultaneously expanding it at every appropriate developmental stage that she goes through and that my responsibility and sacred vow as her mother is to simultaneously in a parallel fashion do that for myself so that I can continue to do that for her. Mm -hmm. And I think that maintaining that level of connection on a soul level and a spiritual level Mm -hmm that then shows up like I'm saying emotionally and psychologically connected, I think is, well, I, first of all, I think that's what a mother is meant to do, but I think that that is the, that is the best thing that I can offer her because I don't know the details and I, I don't, I'm I'm not going to be perfect and I'm not going to know all the things or how to do all the things, but I sure as hell can find a way to fucking overcome myself Mm -hmm. and stay connected to her with her on her journey, no matter what. And that by doing that, it's like the most Uranian light possible for all of us involved can come through. So I just, I just love that image because I mean, I'm going to hold on to that through, (laughs) through this journey of motherhood. And I just want to add the last thing here is that I I again want to refer our listeners to your article, Jessica, on revisioning Saturn because you are bringing the matriarchal aspect of Saturn, which I don't think anyone has done before. Or maybe some people have, but you brought it all together. So thank you so much. I really appreciate that so much. Yeah, that. That, you know, I'm, you're born with Saturn trying Uranus and I'm born with it conjunct uh, mm-hmm. at the midheaven. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, there's a lot of ways I like to rebel against uh, the, uh, the, uh, the tradition and the repast. But a lot of it for me is like Saturn Uranus has to do with the bridge. It's building a bridge between the past and the future. Yeah. And how do we honor the tradition while simultaneously honoring the new thing that's mm-hmm. emerging in consciousness? Mm-hmm. And that article was like, I need to find some way to beat, to, to redeem Saturn in the pantheon because the way that I see it is that it was chosen as the, the, the place to house consciousness and it was chosen by the divine for us to be in this theater we called life. And so we, I have to find a reverential way to be with this process that removes the patriarchal overtones and that makes me live in fear of life. Of, it's mm-hmm. what a crock of shit, you know? It's mm-hmm. like, oh, damn it, I'm not going to live like that. Mm-hmm. Anyways, Christina, this has been awesome. Mm-hmm. I, I love being here with you. I feel like we have like so many more billions of years of conversations to have yeah. together. Yeah, I, I do too. And uh, I really look forward to us um, taking this forward. 
Oh, me too, Christina. I think there's yeah. so many awesome collaborations we can do. And yeah. um, I would just um, hear at the end of this amazing stream into Saturn Uranus, I would love for you to just share with everyone who's listening how they can find you and how they can work with you. As everybody's clearly heard today, Christina mm-hmm. is just so wise and masterful at her her craft. And I'm so happy that you, uh, fate brought you back to astrology for the benefit of all of us who, who get to share in your insight and wisdom. Thank you, Jessica. Um, thank you so much. It was so sweet of you to say. And yeah, this is totally exciting. I love being in dialogue with you. So <laughs> more times that we can do it would be great. So yeah, so um, my website is uh, basically, you don't have to have the www, but I'm going to say it anyway, <laughs> www.transpersonalservices.com. And I've got uh, everything there. I have some other, I have some, uh, some webinars that I've done through uh, the Evolutionary Astrological uh, Zoom folks on the philosophy of evolutionary astrology, in case anyone's interested in that. That's on the homepage. Um, I'm also going to be beginning uh, an introductory course in evolutionary astrology this fall. I think it's yeah September 1st, actually coming up real soon. So it'll be an eight-week course uh, taught on Tuesdays from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So it'll be a two-hour course for eight weeks. Uh, And I am going to be adding, I've had two requests uh, from some international clients uh, to hold another course that kind of accommodates the time difference between us and them because they can't do the 6 to 8 p.m. It puts them into a really weird time. Uh, So I will be offering another course uh, for international students or people who prefer another time. So please contact me directly if you're interested in a different time. Uh, especially if you're internationally based. And that is, uh, so my email is Christina at transpersonal services.com. So thank you, Jessica. This was really awesome. Yeah, you're so welcome. And just, you know, to all my students who are listening right now, um, I really encourage you to check out this class, this course with Christina. I think it's important um, to get other people's, other astrologers' perspectives. But I think it's also great to round out archetypal astrology with evolutionary astrology. And so Trust Psyche will definitely be sending out um, a notification about that course just so that you guys can register and, and, and spend time with Christina And also for everyone who's listening, I really encourage you to get uh, a reading from Christina and you can go to transpersonalservices.com to schedule that with her and get that awesome combination of um, evolutionary astrology and archetypal astrology. And then of course, just all of Christina's heartfelt wisdom. Um, So thank you so much. This is so fun. We're definitely going to do this again. Thank you, Jessica. (laughs) <laughs> my heart is full oh good yes. I'm so sad music to my ears that's what I want to hear <laughs> <laughs> all right everyone well this is stream I'm Jessica Deruzza here with Christina Hardy if you wake up smile if it takes just a little while open your eyes and look at the day you'll see things in a different way don't stop thinking about tomorrow don't stop Yesterday's gone, yesterday's gone
stop thinking about tomorrow. Don't stop. It'll soon be here. It'll be better than before. Yesterday's gone. Yesterday's gone. All I want is to see you smile If it takes just a little while I know you don't believe that it's true I never meant any harm to you Don't stop thinking about tomorrow Don't stop, it'll soon be It'll be better than before Yesterday's gone, yesterday's gone Don't you look back Don't you look back